Uh, today, in your speech, uh, you have been speaking of how philosophers could or should actually contribute to cognitive science. And the other way around, do you think that philosophy as such has something to gain from a connection of actual collaboration with uh, cognitive science? Well, I think you do, and you know, there, there are numerous philosophers who are uh, showing what can be gained from that. Uh, the way I pursue philosophy uh, uh, is not, however, I think, uh, among them. And this is a regard in which um, I'm out of step, both with uh, a significant tradition of analytic philosophy, which has always uh, uh, cared about the science uh, of its time, and, as I indicated uh, earlier, with the pragmatist tradition, which followed the Enlightenment in caring a great deal about the science of our time. The, the sense in which I do care about the science is that is the most sophisticated form of understanding that we have, and it's our job as philosophers to understand that. Um, science is also the most spectacularly successful uh, social institution of the last 300 years, and I think we need to understand that and how that's connected to uh, its cognitive uh, achievements, its achievements in understanding. But that's to take science as a target for understanding. It's a very different thing to try and incorporate uh, results in primatology, in uh, developmental psychology, in uh, cognitive psychology more generally, in neurophysiology, and so on, as inputs into our philosophical thinking. And I'm inclined to make uh, a rel relatively sharp distinction between the philosophical question of uh, what counts as talking or thinking or meaning that things are less than so. And empirical research into how creatures that uh, are evolved, wired up, embodied, and trained as we are, uh, manage to do something like that. Uh, that last seems to me a, a question of considerable intellectual import, uh, but not to be a core philosophical uh, question. A distinction here between saying what the trick consists in, the trick of thinking something, a philosophical question, and saying how the trick is done, uh, which I think is an empirical uh, a question that philosophers as intellectuals can be interested in, but as philosophers uh, have no particular uh, expertise in addressing. And is that question of what would you have to do to count as thinking or saying or meaning that things are thus and so? That's the question that I'm principally uh, interested in. And if we put that in the form, what do you have to do such that doing that counts as uh, saying, thinking, or meaning something? Then we can begin to see uh, the continuity with the pragmatist. Now, uh, speaking specifically of philosophy of the language, do you think that philosophy of language still has a future, or uh, uh, is it open to developments in the future, or will it lose ground to uh, cognitive science? In other words, will the development of cognitive science render philosophy of language obsolete? Well, uh, I don't think so, because language looms so large in uh, cognitive functioning uh, at, at any of the higher levels, at any of the levels that are uh, most significant for thinking about us. Uh, but intellectually, the 20th century was the century of language, uh, not just in analytic philosophy, but absolutely equally in continental uh, philosophy. Uh, no one is more serious philosopher of language than Heidegger, uh, for instance. Uh, it's a serious topic for, uh, for Husserl. Um, uh, the emphasis on genealogy, on ideology in continental philosophy is um, uh, a focus on the way in which, for instance, power relations can uh, come to be embodied and encoded in systematically distorted structures of communication, to use a, uh, a phrase that Habermas uh, has used. Uh, the entire high culture 
in, in its thinking uh, about us uh, has, has come to see the significance of language in transforming uh, us from merely sentient into genuinely sapient creatures. Uh, so there's no question that language is going to continue to be a central focus in cognitive science. Uh, and I believe that philosophers of language bring particular uh, conceptual resources to bear on thinking about language. And one of the reasons we do is because um, uh, our tradition more or less begins with the logical revolution, the revolution ultimately in semantics that uh, Frege initiated, uh, which gave us our first uh, algebraic grip on notions of meaning. Uh, and I think we're in a position there, uh, at, like the position the physicists were in as uh, Galileo and then Descartes uh, began to assemble the, the conceptual tools that would get us a mathematical grip on emotions of middle-sized objects in space. Uh, my question is uh, to look to the future, because during this present workshop, your views and your theories have been commented upon, expanded upon, but also somewhat challenged. So uh, the question is, what uh, are, according to you, the main problems or challenges, really, that your philosophy may have to face? At the center uh, of my views is uh, an approach to semantics uh, from the side of inference. Uh, by contrast to the traditional approach on the side of uh, representation, uh, it, it takes as one of its fundamental categories the notion of expression, but um, read in a conceptual way rather than in uh, a way that's related to emotions, gestures, and so on, which the expressiveness tradition typically had had, that sort of rationalist, inferentialist expressivism, uh, I think was originated uh, by Hegel. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I'm uh, interested in him. But uh, it, it's absolutely critical that we be able to get the sort of algebraic control over conceptual roles that we uh, have seen tantalizing uh, progress in, in the second wave of the modal revolution. Um, I think the first wave of the modal revolution was Kripke's uh, provision of a sound and complete semantics for modal logical vocabulary, but that the most important, uh, philosophically important uh, feature of uh, the modal revolution was the second wave when people like David Lewis Stolmacher, uh, Kaplan, Montague, uh, showed how the apparatus of possible worlds, um, the kind of model theory that uh, Kripke had come up with, extension of Tosky model theory to the modal logical case, uh, could be deployed to provide an intentional semantics for non-logical expressions quite generally. Uh, the third phase of the modal revolution was Kripke's uh, uh, discussion of metaphysical modalities, uh, his separation of necessity from a priority and so on, and uh, naming a necessity. Uh, I actually think the, the philosophical action was in uh, the second wave. Um, it's a challenge for us to extend that progress to uh, a fuller and more flexible way of mathematically representing the meanings of uh, both ordinary non-logical expressions and uh, eventually the sort of philosophically important concepts, concepts like uh, personal identity, uh, concepts like justice, uh, and so on, that uh, philosophers have properly uh, concerned themselves with. And it seems to me these very early days in doing that, uh, on this semantic inferentialist line, uh, the contents of non-logical concepts as well as logical concepts, are articulated by the role they play in uh, massively multi-premise, uh, non-monotonic material inferential relations. And we don't now have a good mathematical representation of such relations 
and the roles that expressions can play in them. So I think the immediate challenge uh, for a semantic differentialist is to see how we can do that. That's really